Exploring North Carolina is made possible by major financial support from the Friends of the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, the largest natural history museum in the Southeast, and a major center for education and research in the natural sciences. Let it be your field guide to the treasures of North Carolina and beyond. By a continuing grant from DTS Software, Mainframe Storage Management Solutions, and by UNC TV viewers like you. Well, I'd like to start by telling you a story of, of why people see, the way that people see technology. There was a, a guy who was in the military, he was stationed in Germany, and he brought his younger brother over to visit with him. And they were walking through this field and a, a nice soft rain came down and his uh, younger brother noticed that there was a rock there on the ground and he, and he picked up this rock and he started cleaning it off. And he said, hey, you gotta come look at this. And when his brother came and looked, he says, look, it's an arrowhead. He said, what were Indians doing over a year? And if you're not getting that story right off, it's the fact that as there were no Indians over there. All people around the world, when we first began, we were using sticks and stones. Today's show, 10,000 Years Before Contact, is about Native American technology in North Carolina and the Southeast before European colonization. Bo Taylor of the Eastern Band of the Cherokee helps us to understand that man is tied to the land on which he lives. And as, as a people, the Cherokees are, are like any, any other nation in the world, and that we all began somewhere, and we all started using stone tools. You know, we, as, as Indians weren't the only people to, to make arrowheads. We weren't the only people to make baskets and do these things. But what we did is that we used these technologies as part of who we are, as part of our environment. It became a part of our identity. The technology involved in the creation of stone tools mentioned by Bo Taylor was not simple. Few people understand stone tools in the Paleo-Indian world better than Steve Watts of the Shield Museum of Natural History in Gastonia, North Carolina. Well, the first Native Americans here, uh, 11 or 12,000 years ago, had a technology based on stone. And it may seem foreign to us, but all human beings 11 or 12,000 years ago were operating on a Stone Age technology from a couple million years ago on up. So this is the Native American technology. It's something common to all of us. It's the common denominator of humanness right here, this Stone Age technology. You know, the, the majority of human history was spent in this Stone Age. We're not just talking about these Native American uh, hunters and gatherers. We're talking about all of us. And, and it's a part of our history that we, we seldom think about. But it's there, and our ancestors left it in the form of these tools and, and, and the archaeological remains that we find. So by, by studying archaeology, by trying to understand how these tools were made and used, 
we can get a greater appreciation not only of Native American cultures, but perhaps our own as well. After a tool is created, it could often be used just handheld, but more efficiency can be, can be gained by hafting it, by attaching it to a handle. Here's a scraper, for instance, that's been attached using the sinew, the tendons of the deer. They could use rawhide, buckskin, cordage made from the plants around them. How a tool is hafted uh, often controls how it's used. For instance, is this a spear point or a knife? The question is often asked. Well, it could be both, you know. Depends on how it's hafted. These are two Hardaway style points. One attached to a handle to be used as a knife. Another attached to a four shaft to be used as a spear. A knife blade, a spear point, two tools in one. In an earlier episode of Exploring North Carolina, we told you about the importance of the Yadkin River Valley. I took a lot of history in high school and college. I learned about the Roman Empire 2,000 years ago, about King Tut in Egypt about 3,300 years ago, and about Stonehenge in England. Stonehenge was built about 5,300 years ago. I was not aware at the time that there is an even longer history here in North Carolina. Native Americans lived and worked here in North Carolina starting about 11,000 years ago. I'm here at the Hardaway site near Baden, North Carolina on the Yadkin River where much can be discovered about Native Americans in the southeast. Dr. Billy Oliver, director of the State Archaeology Research Center in Raleigh, helped us to understand why this region is significant to American Indians in the southeast and why two sites called Hardaway and Dorshuk are so important. In real estate, the term location, location, location means everything. In prehistoric times, that holds true also because Native Americans sought out places to camp that had high ground and access to water. At the Dorshuk site, we have high ground that's a sandy levee near the falls, which contained an abundant resources of fish and turtles that could be exploited. Uh, fish were captured using fish weirs, traps built into the river with baskets to capture the fish. Turtles could be captured also in similar ways. Nearby were deer, bear, turkey, and other game that could be harvested as well. Oliver also helped us to understand the significance of the geology of the region. The debris fields of the Uari region are characterized by rhyolite and andesite that occur in abundance here. Mountains such as Mara Mountain were heavily exploited for stone to manufacture stone tools. The abundance of this material is readily observable by anyone passing by going to Mara Mountain or other places in the region, but oftentimes it's thought to be just simply rocks. It's more than rocks. They're artifacts, the records of what once was. He reminded us of the meaning of layered stratigraphy at the Hardaway and Dorshuk sites. This is the other part of the layer cake, actually the largest part of the layer cake because here we have 11 feet of stratigraphy. At Hardaway, we have about 30 inches, but together they form the twin cornerstones of interpreting prehistory in the eastern woodlands, ranging from 12,000 years ago to the present time. Fortunately, some of these unique archeological sites are protected by Mora Mountain State Park and by Alcoa Power Generating Incorporated. Bob Smith explained the company's concerns. Now, even during the earliest construction of the dam, uh, Native American artifacts were found up and down the river. Now, this area is incredibly rich in cultural resources. Two of the most significant sites are the Hardaway and the Dorshik site. Uh, the Hardaway site was actually named for the Hardaway Construction Company, who was awarded the contract to build Narrows Dam. And the Dorshuk site uh, was named after H.M. Dorshuk, an Alcoa engineer. Although Alcoa's primary business is power generation, uh, we do take our role as stewards of these archaeological resources very seriously. Uh, both the Hardaway and the Dorshuk site are patrolled by our own security staff, and we work with local sheriff's departments uh, to prevent looting or any damage to the sites. At the same time, we want to make them available to universities, researchers, uh, archaeologists, to continue to gain knowledge from those sites and discover what there is to learn about those cultures that occupied those sites. Before visiting other valuable Native American sites in North Carolina, I asked Professor Steve Davis of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill to give a brief outline 
of early technological and social change. The earliest cultural period recognized by archaeologists in North Carolina is called the Paleo-Indian period, and it dates roughly between about 10,000 and 12,000 years ago. Uh, the key artifact for recognizing the Paleo-Indian period is a lancelet stone fluted spear point. Um, these are usually typed as Clovis or Hardaway, and they're very well made. Uh, they're usually made of an exotic raw material, which indicates that these peoples covered a fairly large area during the course of the seasonal round. They were highly mobile. In the southeast, at least, Paleo-Indians had a lot of resource options. Unlike the previous model of Paleo-Indians being just focused on hunting big game or hunting large mammals, that instead um, they had a much more complex economy based both on hunting and also on gathering of a variety of resources when they became seasonally available. The cultural period following the Paleo-Indian period is what archaeologists call the Archaic period and dates between about 10,000 years ago and 3,000 years ago. Uh, during the early Archaic period, the archaeological evidence suggests that people lived still primarily as they had during the earlier Paleo-Indian period. Um, they were fairly highly mobile, uh, population was increasing. Uh, during the su subsequent Middle Archaic period, uh, evidence suggests that people began to settle in to much more local environments. The period following the Archaic was a time of change for the peoples who lived in North Carolina and the surrounding Southeast. And it's a period which archaeologists call the Woodland Period. Um, there are four, at least four significant changes that occurred. Um, the first was the introduction of pottery making. Uh, at the beginning of the Woodland Period, peoples began to make clay pots, clay vessels, and these um, fragments of these vessels occur in large quantities. Uh, another change that occurred was in weaponry. Now, during the early woodland period, peoples probably still used the old addle addle as they had for thousands of years previously, a spear thrower. Um, but sometime by about the middle woodland period, about 1,500 years ago, they uh, abandoned that technology and adopted the bow and arrow. During this time period, the economies also began to change, slowly, but it changed. Uh, instead of being exclusive hunters and gatherers, peoples gradually began to plant and grow some of their own foods. Uh, squash was grown fairly early, as were some uh, native cultigens. And then after 1000 AD, uh, corn was added to the diet, and then beans were added as well. The woodland was also a period in which people began to settle down more. Um, instead of uh, living in small bands or small groups and moving seasonally, they began to stay put. About a thousand years ago, things got a little more complicated. Um, woodland societies continued to exist in many areas of the southeast, but in others, a new cultural manifestation emerged, and this is what archaeologists call Mississippian. In North Carolina, after about 1000 AD, uh, Mississippian societies are recognized in the western part of the state and in parts of the southern part of North Carolina. The divide between the Mississippian world and the woodland, continuing woodland world is about where the Adkin River is, um, the exception being the southern sand hills uh, where Town Creek Indian Mound is located. Town Creek is a Mississippian site. Uh, woodland societies uh, tended to be uh, organized, you know, as tribes. Uh, Mississippian towns tend to reflect um, a greater level of organization. With this background, Exploring North Carolina visited several North Carolina archaeological sites where human history spans thousands of years. When people think of old cities in the southeast, they may think of Raleigh or Charlotte, both about 200 years old. I'm on the campus of Warren Wilson College near Asheville, North Carolina, where our human presence has been documented for over 7,000 years. Dr. David Moore of Warren Wilson College is a well-known expert on Native American history in the area. 
The Warren Wilson site is especially important because we see through our excavations the different layers of occupation reflected in the different soil levels. And in the earliest levels from the middle and late archaic, uh, the artifacts we find represent a lifestyle of hunters and gatherers, people who are living here intermittently, living in small camps uh, while they traveled through the region. Later in the woodland period, we find the beginnings of small villages. Uh, and finally, in the Mississippian period, we find settled permanent towns uh, with palisades surrounding the houses. The Swannanoa Valley has lots of resources, natural resources. Uh, with the site situated right here, they were able to take advantage of transportation routes along the river. They can make their way up into the mountains easily for hunting and gathering. And later, during the Mississippian period, they were able to farm the expanse of bottomlands with the rich alluvial soil. Some of, the, some of the features that we look at during our excavation are called pits. Uh, these are holes that have been dug into the ground and filled with refuse or used for cooking. And archaeologists find a lot of important information from excavating these pits or features. And we may find evidence of foods either from hunted animals or from wild plant foods. And these included kinopodium, marsh elder. Uh, what's, what's really interesting is that the fact that nuts from nut trees, like uh, acorns and hickory and chestnut, probably provided more calories for native peoples than they got from hunted animals. The Warren Wilson site gives us a lot of information about the Mississippian period agriculturalists as well. Uh, from about 1200 to 1500 AD, as the Mississippian village was occupying this area, people used the bottomlands to farm. And we find evidence from those features that are filled with the, the refuse from their meals, we find evidence for corn and pumpkins, beans, squash, tobacco. These people were full-time agriculturalists. We study archaeology to understand the past. We under, try to understand people in the past. And here at the Warren Wilson site, those people are Native Americans. And it's important to understand that while we have occupations that are thousands of years old, the Cherokee Indians of today are descendants of those people. I was honored to talk with Jerry Wolf of the Eastern Band of the Cherokee, who helped me understand the continued connection between American Indians and the land. Today, a lot of hikers hike the mountains, and all they see is the trail. They're walking. They don't look around and see the buckeye tree or the hickory tree or all the species of trees that are around them. They don't even see wild animals. When you walk with a quietness, you observe, you see all these things. We have some, so many uh, varieties that come up. Also, we have the wild blackberries, and we used to have the strawberries a long time ago when I was growing up. My mother would go out and uh, get a, a gallon of strawberries and uh, they're entirely different to that of the, the uh, tame strawberries that we have today in these nurseries. And uh, the, the blueberries, we call them the huckleberries. Uh, huckleberry plants uh, are no more hardly in the woods. The water was so pure that uh, you could drink it just anywhere. You didn't have to boil it. You didn't have to worry about getting sick from drinking uh, polluted water. And you know, when I was growing up, and, uh, so it was uh, very, very clean, very clean water. We've always uh, looked down on the soil because it furnishes everything. It doesn't only furnish. Uh, it furnishes the timber, the food, uh, all things comes from the ground. We, we honor just about everything because everything, I understand, is connected. 
all people are connected and plants, even uh, the animals of the forest and uh, the fowl of the air, the fish of the sea, the reptiles. And uh, the rattlesnake was never killed, uh, especially a yellow one, if you saw it in the woods. But she spoke to that snake and told it to move. You move out of the way and uh, where, where, and go where you crawl, where people don't, uh, don't use. If that rattlesnake will hold his head up and he'll listen. And when you finish speaking with him, he'll drop his head down and he'll start crawling. And he'll crawl back into the high timbers and he moves out of the way. From the mountains, exploring North Carolina traveled to Pettigrew State Park, site of one of the most fascinating archaeological discoveries in recent years. At this site, Native American artifacts such as tools and points have been located and date back approximately 10,000 years. Perhaps the most important record of Native Americans are the large dugout canoes that were found here in the mid-1980s. These canoes are significant in the fact that they cover a time span of a few hundred years all the way back to 4,500 years. As of this date, Pettigrew State Park officials, along with other scientists, have discovered 30 dugout canoes, some ranging in length up to 40 feet. The ages of these canoes have been established using carbon dating and other techniques. Many people wonder why these boats don't rot. Well, they're made of decay-resistant cypress, covered over by silt, and then found in very acidic waters, which helps to protect them. One of the most promising new digs in American Indian archaeology is at Barber Creek near Greenville, North Carolina. It is directed by Dr. Randy Daniel of East Carolina University. There's a maximum in archaeology. To find old sites, you have to find old dirt. Near the Tar River, we have found a sand ridge that contains old dirt. In that sand ridge, we have found a series of prehistoric occupations beginning about 10,000 years ago up until about 3,000 years ago. The earliest artifacts uncovered at Barber Creek to date consist of projectile points that are notched at the base, what we call corner notch points. In the middle archaic, we have stem points, and in the late archaic, we have also had stem points that are stylistically a little bit different than the stem points in the middle archaic. Capping this archaic sequence, we have the early woodland, which is characterized by the presence of pottery. Pottery doesn't exist prior to about 1000 BC. This pottery at Barber Creek is the hallmark of the early woodland period. Stacked in layer cake-like fashion in the sand ridge along Barber Creek, we have found evidence of occupations dating back 10,000 years. The sand ridge is some seven feet thick. The occupations we have found are only three feet thick. That means we've got at least another three feet of sand to go. We've only excavated a fraction of a percent of the site. With a little bit of luck, we may find some of evidence of some of the earliest North Carolinians at Barber Creek. Regardless of what sites we visited, they all held objects of incredible utilitarian and artistic value. What happened to the Paleo Indians, the Archaic Indians, the Woodland Indians, Mississippian Indians? Well, they're, they're here among us today through their descendants. Um, the modern day North Carolinians of Native American descent are the descendants of those peoples. Um, Paleo Indians did not become extinct, they became Archaic Indians. Archaic Indians became Woodland Indians. Woodland Indians uh, either became Mississippian Indians or continued as Woodland Indians and in the historic period were known by various tribal names and today their descendants um, also claim identity to those tribal names. For additional information about this or other episodes go to these websites. 
Exploring North Carolina is made possible by major financial support from the Friends of the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, the largest natural history museum in the Southeast, and a major center for education and research in the natural sciences. Let it be your field guide to the treasures of North Carolina and beyond. By a continuing grant from DTS Software, Mainframe Storage Management Solutions, and by UNC-TV viewers like you.